Hi, I am Amon Prokarami. I am Head of Consulting at Grey Doors Group. In my role, I keep my ear to the ground and my finger on the pulse on what's happening in the business travel industry. Here are the top five stories that I have read recently, along with my tips on what you can take from each of these, applying them to your travel program to the benefit of your own organization. So first up is an article in Forbes magazine by Bernard Schroeder, who's a senior contributor to the publication. It's titled, Travel Will Be Bigger Than Ever, Just Different. And, it's a, and how this presents as a great opportunity for startups as Bernard sees it. What Bernard believes is that while the pandemic may be temporary, there has been permanent shifts to our work behavior as a result. Principally with the rise of remote working, we've, however, it's caused some fatigue. And on the flip side, this has created a lot of flexibility for remote workers in terms of where they're physically located. Now, you have seen already some Caribbean countries have offered extended visa restrictions to allow organizations, travelers, to re relocate themselves for as much as 12 months in a host country. Now, this clearly has some aspects in relation to tax. Um, I would strongly recommend reviewing that if that is the premise of your work. So quite a number of even EU countries have, have taken note of this trend and started to put in tax re regulations in result of ensuring that these travelers are taxed within that host country and not just their destination. So this important to factor in the policy concerns in regards to whom you decide is permitted to be a digital nomad, as it's been referred to. Bernard goes on to discuss uh, what organizations should be doing in relation to this, and he focuses on um, Airbnb as an example of, of organizations that can really shift their product offering to be able to entice these kind of travelers. My second article goes into a little bit more detail, actually, and describes what Airbnb are actually doing. And this is in Bloomberg, um, and it's actually written by Brian Chesky, who is the chief executive officer at Airbnb. Now, his view is that, that he agrees that the lines between travel, work and living have been blurred permanently. And he feels that um, although companies uh, will return to being strict, have the temptation to return to be strict in regards to employees returning to the office. Uh, his feeling is that, that in order to retain and attract new talent, especially of the younger audience, the digital requirements will be needed to play, take place. And he forecasts that individuals will prefer to work remotely and will come together for key moments. Um, so he refers to it as business business travel 2.0, where companies working remotely will come back to their HQ for a week at a time for busy planning meetings, and the rest will be whilst they're traveling around. Now, the view on this is that, so they've already seen that 24% of their business bookings are being made for people who are traveling for 28 days or longer. With this in mind, that, the, the idea would be that quite clearly you would already have individuals in, say, the construction space or manufacturing are already from our client base traveling for terms longer than this. So that those processes have been in place for quite some time. What this adds is that you have the senior executives perhaps allowing themselves to travel from one location to a longer for lot for periods that are longer, but they'll be traveling for less trips. My recommendation here is that you also review which employees that this would be suited for if you're going to consider allowing this within your travel policy. I'll give you an example. So those organizations where teamwork is essential, remote working and while we're using practices such as Zoom, um, it does not really work conducively for having uh, brainstorming sessions and has been shown to reduce productivity. I would recommend that you review this policy to ensure that those who are in a creative collaborative work environment 
are clustered together as much as possible, as it will end up being quite costly and time consuming to have these individuals return to a base from all ends of the, the, the country, all ends of the planet. We also need to look at the, the, the behavior that remote working draws by on a, person, on a person's mental health. Now, there's been quite a lot of articles distributed regarding the impact that remote working is having on mental health. Now, the, the negative behind this is that what you'll find is that people will feel, as the word suggests, remote, isolated potentially. And there's means in which you can look at um, reacting to this in a beneficial format. And the third article that I want to review speaks exactly to this issue. It's written by Nuffield Health um, and it's titled The Effects of Remote Working on Stress, Wellbeing and Productivity. The, the premise behind this is that it looks at the advantages and challenges for employees and their employers. So one of the points I wanted to, to bring up within this publication, which is excellent, um, is in regards to um, what, what in relation to the stresses that isolation can cause. So it points to a piece of research that finds that 12.5% um, 12, 12 of those aged between 21 and 25 um, indicated that they suffer from depression from working within a remote working environment. So it's perhaps it's perhaps a good idea because it stresses the point that older and experienced employees account for 70% of the, over 70% of those working from home and senior staff make a greater proportional use of this facility compared to non-managerial staff. So you might want to look at it, maybe not from an age perspective, but in terms of a seniority of work and therefore those individuals. It also offers some fantastic advice on how to spot relation, um, how to spot individuals that are perhaps finding this um, an issue to begin with. And you can, as an organization, obviously you're hoping that your employees will come forward, but many will be reluctant to do so. And it points to changes of behaviors, increased sickness, um, reduction in productivity. So I would look to train managers if you're looking to move towards a more remote working environment is to be able to proactively stay in touch with their with your employees particularly those who have just joined the organization and perhaps weren't involved in the culture that was fostered to begin with pre-covid 19 and are now working towards that business area So moving on to our next article, it comes from the International Air Transport Association's IATA, which is, um, which is the leading trade association for the world's airlines. It represents around 290 airlines globally. Um, and what they've put together by Brian Pease, their chief economist, is a projection on the recovery of air travel. Now, this is a quite a prominent piece because it takes in historic data from the airline industry and it looks at previous shocks such as SARS, 9-11, the financial pressures, crashes of 1991 and 2009. And what it's predicting is that while the shocks had a 5 to 20 percent decline in revenue per passengers flown, the recovery was six to nine months to those pre-event levels. Now, clearly, you may see an argument that COVID has had more than an 80% reduction as opposed to those that were 5 to 20% in the previous cases and has, has so far been 14 months and counting in terms of the impact that it's had, whereas those were more weeks or, or, and months rather than um, in terms of restrictions that were put into place. So the, I also report that the, the levels in terms of flown is at 40% pre-pandemic levels. So we are seeing a rec recovery from the bottomed out at 20%. Now, where it sees recovery first is in the large geographic regions where there's dom domestic flights taking place. So for example, China is already at 2019 levels and the Bra Brazil and US are due to recover by the end of this year. 
in terms of international travel, what you see is that the perhaps the, perhaps the biggest game changer here will be the wide um, vaccination levels taking place. And we're likely to see widespread vaccination in H2 of this year, um, moving on to H3 in terms of the leading economies. So let's look at the UK. So what we're looking at within the UK is obviously the first jab. Um, so over two thirds of in adults in the UK have had their first jab. And the US is not far behind in terms of um, their vaccinations that would sit around 60% of adults. And both countries are aiming to have all adults um, given their first dose by the, by the end of July. So what does this mean for you as a business? Is that, well, the first thing is that if, if you if you look at your top top routes in which you go to, I always recommend the 80-20 rule. So what your 80% of your, your spend is in terms of travel, in terms of the geographies that you go to, is the first things you want to look at is what the vaccination levels are in those areas. So I would recommend doing a review on that and then adjusting your expectations in terms of your policies to flying within those regions. So let's just say, for example, you're going out to the US, then the likelihood is that um, if several of your trips are going to the US, at the moment, the case is that the, there, is a bar there is a restriction in terms of flying to those regions from both the UK and the US. But what you can expect is that for that to be opened by July in some form, and I will go through that in my last article just now, but, the biggest thing that you need to be focusing on here is planning for that eventuality. So what kind of trips are permissible, who can fly um, and how long for and what kind of um, suppliers you wish to use and to deem safe. So you may decide in this particular circumstance to reduce the individuals that are flying, perhaps get more out of their visits, so therefore increase the time, so they maybe see more individuals, more departments, more customers than they would normally, uh, to make sure that that's ticked, given the cost of testing and the complications with that. You may also look to limit the number of individuals that fly together. Um, that might be a safety consideration that you look into, because of course, the threat of somebody catching COVID. You've seen that in sporting conferences where you've got teams in the football space who have had seven or eight team members lay down from COVID and the impact that that has on their performance. The same can be taken in a business context. So it's worth reviewing how many individuals you allow, especially from one department, to travel at a time. My recommendation is that you cap this to around three to four. Moving on in terms of looking at an article by Miriam Towell in The Express, this is looking at a potential travel corridor between the US and the UK. As it stands today, British tourists can't enter the US if they've been into UK, Ireland or the Shenzhen zone um, within the previous 10 days. So uh, anyone returning from the US, which is on the government and the list currently, requires a 10 day quarantine period on arrival back to the UK. Now, obviously, with the, the strength of the vaccination levels of both of these nations, there's quite a lot of debate and push for major airlines, um, for example, Virgin Atlantic, British Airways, American Airlines, United Airlines and Delta have all sent a letter to the US Transport Secretary pushing for a travel corridor to be between these two nations. And you're seeing this within China and Singapore, these kind of travel corridors that are reciprocal that allows an opening based on rapid testing taking place. And this would be very beneficial for trade between these nations. So what is it that you can expect here is that the, the hope is that um, the, two the two countries, Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, and Joe Biden and his counterpart in the US, get together and agree on an air corridor. And I fully anticipate this happening by um, by July, much in, in line with once all of the pop, once all the population, the adult population have been offered the vaccine. So keeping that in mind, and I do hope the premise will be that further 
ads will be added to the green list on our on our country and would, the biggest benefit would be if they're reciprocal because as we're noticing today there's currently 11 on the green list with portugal dropping into the amber zone as of today but the hope is that if it, they're on the green list they're also on the green list from the other side, which is not being taken place at the moment. So we need to have some um, duality there. And that's something that IATA are promoting and working for today. I wanted to introduce um, another subject matter, which IATA have released, um, which is quite prominent because not only are we experiencing issues in regards to restrictions on travel in certain terms of movement? But there is there is an element whereby the, there's delays at the airports currently. So what well, IATA have released some data that suggested that pre-COVID-19, um, the average travel process for each journey in terms of check-in, security, border control, customs and baggage claim would take... A, 1.5 hours, so one and a half hours to get through an airport. Currently, that's doubled to three hours, and we're only at around three, 30 to 40% of pre-COVID levels. So the greater the, the number of increases in border control is that what's happened with their modeling is they're suggesting if it goes up to 75% of pre-COVID levels in terms of traffic demand, is that what you'll see is it will go up to five and a half hours of delays. Now, for an organization, clearly, from a business perspective, this is um, this is going to be quite damaging because nobody would want to wait for that length of time. My recommendations here is that what you need to do is obviously make sure that you have all your documentations in place. You also, from a travel policy point of view, you want to limit the, the any indirect flights, so any kind of transfers that you have because there's obviously a risk of you missing your flights. In addition to that, what you want to do is work with your suppliers in regards to flexible tickets in, in case you need to make changes. The other aspect is I've been looking into this and there's currently no suppliers within the market space that are offering you a fast track to that process. It's just a matter of immigration, but I do expect this to come into place. And hopefully, while with IATA, what they're calling for is that the your e-gates that you use currently that allow you to transfer via the airport will include, and this is the, the hope that we're having in Q3 of this year, is that they will be updated to include those digital health passports. So I do think if you to prepare yourself for a full launch by Q3 of this year in terms of business travel, you won't be disappointed. <music> Links to all the articles I've discussed today are in the description below. I will be back again soon with my take on the top stories making the headlines in business travel. Until then, stay safe and I'll speak to you soon.